great pleasure to welcome one, welcome one of my colleagues on stage, Sonia. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not ideal timing for the injury. <laughs> Okay, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm glad to be here in this plenary. A lot of you are new to the Open Group Conferences, so it's, I'm glad that, and I hope you receive a lot this week from us. Like Steve was saying, I'm going to talk a little bit about the new version of the TOGAP standard, but not only what is new in the standard, but mostly what we are um, Considering the future of the standard and the evolution of the standard, we have been listening since yesterday and also in the conversation that we have with Dave uh, right now uh, about the digital trends, about the digital challenges. So our standards, being TOGA, one of them need to be ready to address that. So my presentation today will be mostly addressing that. So I will start first with this uh, thought that for me is very interesting, that it's not the strongest species, the one that it will make it, but the one that is more adaptable to the environment, the one that will be sobriety. This is a little agenda. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about operational transformation and innovation, how we need to be prepared for that, best practices and open standards about that. On my list of view, I'm going to refer to the practice, not only the standard, then enterprise architecture, digital transformation, agile, how to deliver an agile EA. And then we're going into the talk of standard, what's new in the 9.2 version, and especially what's in the evolution of the standard, which is, I would say, the main point, then some wrap up, and then some Q&A. Organizational transformation, I guess like, again, like yesterday, we had excellent presentations about digital. Uh, all of us now, we have now disrupted business model. We are changing the way we communicate, the way uh, we share information. We have new paradigms now, uh, innovations in telecommunications and um, social learning, uh, mobile automation, uh, social learning, interfacial intelligence. Now the way that we need to prepare our companies to really to face that is completely different. It's not like in the old ways in which we have a set of requirements and we build the systems. Now it's completely different. Now building the system is not exactly only an inside out, but mostly an outside in perspective, considering what it is in our ecosystem and how that ecosystem is related and wired together. We have, as you know, technology trends, and we have now artificial intelligence, which is uh, one of the trends that we saw higher in the Slido um, that we showed at the beginning. We have robotics, we have drones, we have new business models now like Netflix, Uber, Amazon, and some models that are radically changed the way that we do business and the way where organizations should evolve. We have now new mobility, social media. The way we do marketing is completely different now. Uh, I guess like the ones of you that have teenagers or very young uh, sons or daughters have realized that now kids are all the time in blogs and social media. Some of them are becoming influencers, which is a different way to do marketing. Now, so like you, you see, this is completely different the way that we do business a few years ago. So what about our companies? I mean, we have on one side all these new trends, all these new challenges, and on the other hand, we have the day-to-day -day things to deal with. We have all this complexity, all these systems, depending on the industry you are in, it could be legacy systems, some of them, which are connected point to point, believe it or not, there are still systems that are following that path. So this is the challenge. What can I do to transform our organization but continue in my day-to-day -day operation? Because it's not like going to throw away whatever I have and start from new. I need to take what I have and be able to transform that. And that's not easy. That's a big challenge. So what is key here is to understand what I have. I cannot change the things that I don't know. And one of the principles about enterprise architecture is address complexity and change. If I have a small cabin in the beach, I, d I don't have to do architecture for that because it's very simple and it's not changing. But if I'm in a big city like New York or having a, a big building, uh, in that case, I need to be aware that I need to architect that because I need to change it and it's complex. And the same happens with companies. So whatever industry you are, you need to be aware of which capabilities do you have which one are your strategies, how I'm going to share them. Now, how I'm going to connect that with all the ecosystem that we have, how I'm going to deal with my partners, my competitors, my customers, how to address this customer journey, which is changing completely 
the way business are, are made and wired. What about these best practices? How enterprise architects can, can support this and can provide this view? And we can have different flavors for finding a word about enterprise architecture. You will see a traditional building in the left side, which is the way that perhaps we did architecture a few years ago. OK, I have the business in, in here, I have the processes, I have certain capabilities, I have information which is pervasive in all the different layers, I have applications, I have systems. I need to connect all that and also be aware to be aligned with the strategy. Now, I still have all that, but in a more complex uh, fashion, like the building you will see in the right hand, which is like more modern with a different view, perhaps uh, it will need to change easier. It will have more exposure for the end customer. And I need to be aware that this new building have different and more complex entities into that. So making this comparison, we can say, OK, in the old days, I used to have my own architecture. And sometimes I will need to take certain aspects from the outside. Now, that's completely different. We have now the customer journey, which is the first point in which my customer is interacting with me. It's not anymore that my customer is getting into my uh, business or even using an internet page. That was a few days, a few years ago. Now it's completely different. The customer can interact with me through, the, through an application on the mobile, the iPad, not even the computer. It's you not know, the applications. There are you know, mobile devices, which is completely different. We need to be aware that we need to be connecting all this change, all this ecosystem change. So my system will have visibility. Uh, you may be aware now, you book a flight, and immediately you start receiving all the promotion through email saying, OK, you're going to Singapore, so take advantage of this new restaurant, this rent this car. All of that is coming to us because business are connected. And if you are not into that connection, you are lost and you are out of business. So we need to be able to understand these multi-channel connection points. Uh, our business models, our product and services uh, are completely different now. They have to be digitized. They have to be uh, considered differently. We need to address customer needs differently. In terms of information, we need to be aware how to profile my customer. For example, these persons travel a lot, so I'm constantly sending this person information about flights, hotels, car rental, etc. This person is not traveling that much, but likes to eat in fancy restaurants, so I'm sending this person information about restaurants. This person likes to dress up, so I'm sending information about fashion, about the latest styles in fashion. So that's the way that we need to provide information to our customers. So profiling our customer and understanding the need of my customer is even more important now. That's where data is pervasive and it should be interoperable, not only in my system, but also in the outside systems. Of course, business capabilities, processes, services, they are still there, they are connecting everything, but need to be connected differently now. It's not only connecting my processes, most of my applications or processes might be in the cloud or in an external service, so I need to be aware of those service levels. I need to be aware how these different pieces, my provider, my customers, my partners are interacting. So it became more complex to provide all this integration. We have APIs everywhere now. We have different architecture styles. We have now a microservice architecture. We have adaptable architecture. We have EA artificial intelligence, we have blockchain, we have all these different pieces that now are becoming different building blocks, like we speak in architecture, to be, to be connected differently. So we need to address this complexity. So at the end of the day, even though the shape of my business is different, the shape of my applications and my landscape is different, I still need to understand that. So it's not about changing where EA is going for the traditional quoting definition of enterprise architecture, which is the component, the description of the different component of my system, how they are in, interconnected uh, to change them and to become them more flexible. At the end of the day, it's the same. I mean, we still have these different components, but they are even more complex today because they are distributed. Because I, my service level not only depends on me, it depends also on my providers, on my partners. So it's even more complicated. So the need to have this clear landscape of what I have, this holistic systemic view, is even more important now than it used to be in the quoting again all days. So at the end of the day, the practice is there. It's just perhaps that I need to use it differently. And I'm going to explain what it could be differently 
in a few slides. And again, it's not only about technology, it's not only going for the latest trend, agile, DevOps, safe or frameworks, practices. It's not, okay, this is fashion, everybody's talking about that, let's go ahead and use it. It's not like that. You need to address your business. You need to know where you are, you need to know your market. You need to know your culture. At the end of the day, it's not only technology, it's your business, it's your culture, it's your people. For example, in a bank, banks usually have, in my view, two different layers, big layers. One of them is the usual legacy system in which you have steel mainframes, which are very good for big trans transaction processing. You have all these systems, some of them are legacy. It could be a mixture of internal development, there still is there, and application uh, that uh, banks have been acquiring over time. And all of them are wiring connected uh, with a certain level of complexity. This kind of, of layers change less because they are not so visible to the end customer. However, they are vital. Imagine not being able to, to, to check your transaction in your car, your credit card, even though you're having the, face, the fancy smartphone if transactions are not okay. You will be scared, I mean, what is this? I mean, this, I didn't make this transaction, it's because the legacy system is failing, so this is key. But it's more tightly coupled, it's not like uh, so visible to the end customer. So perhaps the way I have to architect this is a little bit different. But if we go into the upper layer, in which we have all this multi-channel environment in which I have my banking in the palm of my hand through my mobile, in which I can connect through the phone and ask for, for, for a uh, movement that I have made in my car. I am in, in, in my WhatsApp and I receive a message, a transaction has been made into your account. This is the upper layer. That one has more visibility. Customer is looking at that all the time. It should be more interconnected. So it should be more dynamic, uh, wired differently, microservices, loose couple styles of architecture, and interconnections because it's visible and it's flexible. So we need to have sometimes two different kinds of approaches even into the same company to address this, not to mention all the regulatory and compliance that banks need to face. Similar situation is in government. You have some, some, some information that is sensitive in governments, that is always subject to, role, to rules and to legislation, and you have the other layer in which you need to provide services to the customer, to the citizenship, using something that is quickly and that is accessible to them. So that's the thing. So at the end, what we need to do is to be able to understand this, your situation, how the different teams of architects should work together and engage together. Some of them may be working in a more, quoting again, old fashioned way. But the other ones, the ones that are facing the customer should be more agile. So that's the way in which different styles of a framework or a practice should change. And this, I think this is not only applicable to enterprise architecture, but in general, the way that you handle your business should be aware of that. So again, coming back to the, to the layer of the use we, we saw a few minutes ago, we still need to have a way to deliver EA, but if you are facing the, facing the customer, you need to have a more agile EA approach to respond faster. So for example, okay, I have, a new application that it's allowing my, my customer to watch immediately a, trans, a transaction in the credit card. And that application is failing right now. Okay, you need to fix it in hours. It's not even in days. So that's an agile way to deliver. If it's something that is more internal, it could be a little bit more like in the background. But if you are in the upper layer, you need to be more agile. You still need to deliver this incremental architecture, which is a concept that we all know, the ones that are Architects in here, it's a concept of enterprise architecture to deliver value incrementally in shorter cycles. And address complex management, like I just mentioned, it's even more needed now. Uh, to adopt reference models, which is another key thing. I mean, one of the principles about being agile is being able to reuse and have technical excellence. And reference models are a very good way to reuse and also to interoperate. If you're using a reference model, for example, again, for banking or for retail industry or for data, those reusable components are also supporting interoperability and making it easier for you to share with other partners or customers. Uh, loose coupling is now, um, it has been a, a design partner for years. Now we have microservices and we have other kind of architectural styles and patterns that are supporting all this. And I, I'll help you be uh, faster in the way you are responding to 
to the new challenges and the new way to deliver value uh, incrementally. And third parties are now key. So you need to be able to understand and communicate with your partners, with your customers, with your suppliers. And, and so the use of open standard, it becomes even more and more relevant. Because if you are, it's like speaking a language. I mean, if you have a person that speaks Chinese and you other one that speaks Spanish, it would be impossible for them to communicate. But if both of them are using a protocol in English in the middle, which is an analogy of an open standard, then it would be easier to communicate. So that's even more important now. OK, what about enterprise architecture and digital transformation? We have been listening about digital transformation in the plenaries yesterday and also in the conversation we had earlier with Dave. And digital transformation is just beyond just having uh, new technical styles in the company or new technologies. It starts with the strategy. I have taken this uh, slide from one of our uh, members and sponsor today, Biz Design. They have a very good paper, uh, which is the, the adaptive enterprise. And they talk about how you have disruptive, uh, to address these disruptive new business models which are in the market. But you need to rationalize that into your business. I mean, it's not because of some fashion. I need to figure out if this is going to be helpful for me and my organization. You need to make a risk assessment, an impact assessment, which is something like sometimes um, there's this trade-off between being agile and, and being careful about risks and about not taking so many chances to go in the pitfall. So that's something that we need to keep in balance. And on the other hand, when you have understood all your risks and all your impact assessment, you go and you create this business roadmap to transform to your organization. And if you, you see that you need to generate first these ideas about how to address these new trends, and here you can use any of the frameworks and, and methodologies there are now for innovation, being one of them design thinking, for example, which is very used right now. Then, in terms of development, you can start about using Agile, DevOps, Lean, whatever all the other methodologies that are now um, in the market. And, and then, at the end, you start delivering using, for example, an Agile approach and for delivering your solutions. But at the end of the day, what you have in the top is the need to understand your holistic picture, your systemic view, and what do you have in your organization. Coming back to Agile again. Agile can be understood in different ways. This uh, uh, slide was taken from one of our uh, presentations uh, in, in Ottawa. And, and it was about Agile using a, in a practical case study. You can have Agile to develop and deliver EA. This is something that we're going to, to, I'm going to present a few ideas uh, in a few slides. You can also use EA to define an Agile approach and to support your Agile sprints into the organization to provide them some direction, to provide them some this holistic view on the strategic alignment. Avoid them, OK, it's, it's fine to deliver value quickly, but that value really needs to be aligned with the strategic view of the organization and need to be addressing all the risk and all the impact. You can also use it to be, help an organization to become agile, which is a completely different thing. Because one thing is to apply the practice for a particular sprint or project or approach, and the other is helping your whole organization to become agile, which is even more difficult because it's not completely in your control. You can more or less control your EA team and engage that with the sprints and with the agile teams, but it's more difficult when you have to take your whole organization and try to, to make it be more agile. So that's, there are different views and different ways to apply that. First of all, if you wanted to be, have an agile EA, you need to build an EA capability, which is more agile. And it's not that you're going to change the practice. It's just the way you use it. This is being taken from uh, it's on the world, uh, in the world class papers that we have at the Open Group and also in the Leaders Guide, which is one of the talk of series guide that I'm going to explain at the end of my presentation. Here you will see uh, a, a capability map for your EA practice. Started for the general capabilities to the ones that are more into the purpose, uh, architecture to deliver strategy, portfolio, projects, and solution delivery. And that's the one that are foundational. In all the different levels, you need to change the approach if you really want to be agile. That means, for example, having an EA Agile Toolkit, the proper tooling, the repository may be, need to be constructed differently. You need to prepare your uh, EA team to become more agile. Being able to talk with solution delivery team, which is something that 
we are still have this struggle in between architects and solution delivery people. You need, you need to close that gap. You need to be ready to provide value incrementally, to provide more agile incremental architectures, trying to pair them with some uh, sprint delivery, which is not easy. I mean, it's a, a change in approach that but it's completely able to be done, but you need to be aware that you need to do that. You need to plan for that. Uh, you need to start thinking about avoiding dropping this big plan and starting with what will be called MVA, which is minimal viable architecture. Just architect the minimum and be pragmatic. You still need to have your strategic view, of course. You have your strategic view, you define what are you going to do, defining a good scope, and then you finally provide only the necessary detail. There are different views and flavors in here. This is not a presentation about Agile. However, you need to be aware that this is one of the things. I mean, one of the uh, more common sayings is like, hey, the issue with enterprise architecture is like, it, it is too big, it takes a lot of time, and it becomes out of date very quickly. That, that is true, but it depends how you do it, the kind of tooling you are using. And now you have these uh, new uh, trends about also Agile modeling. If you're using patterns, if you're using reference architectures, and you're architecting just the minimum, that issue becomes less. So again, it depends how are you using the different practices. Enterprise agil agility, that's the other dimension of this. How enterprise architecture can be used along with an agile approach to deliver this. This presentation, this slide was taken from uh, one presentation from our Peru regional event a few weeks ago. Uh, which is, was delivered by, by Connexium. We have five dimensions, at least, to consider about your organization becoming agile. One of them is being alert. For that, having this complete landscape, having this strategic view, and also paying attention to what's going on around you. It's crucial and it's vital. And it's what you do. If you start doing, for example, taking, for example, the TOGAF standard in your preliminary and your vision phases, in which you start understanding your context. On the other hand, you need, help, you need to have the proper information to take decisions. So one of the phases of the ADM, going again to the TOGAF standard, is how to have this knowledge and information ready to take that decisions. You need to be quickly in decision taken. And in order to do that, if you don't understand your landscape and you don't do a proper impact assessment, then you will have a pitfall at the end. Being able to change quickly, again, you need to have this a complete view and all your capabilities, how they are connected in order to really be able to change them. And again, flexibility, one of the things that, again, you need to address while doing enterprise architecture is complexity and change. You need to be flexible to change and have this complete uh, landscape and these views will help you be flexible and accept changes in an easier way. And in here, again, that's a change of shift of paradigm with the change management that we usually have uh, when we apply enterprise architecture. If you apply governance and, and change management in your EA practice, you need to stop having this impression of being the auditor that is how it is in the development. You need to be working with the teams for this to be really be flexible and to be really providing value. So if you, can, you can have this mapping. This is my personal point of view and how you can make some we have the Agile Manifesto, and we have a set of EA principles that you are the ones that you usually put together in your preliminary phase. This is the, uh, like most of you know, the talk of ADM. So one of the things that the Agile Manifesto says is that we need to satisfy the customer through continuous delivery of value, and you need to welcome change all the way in the project. It doesn't matter if there is at the beginning or if it is at the end. So no one is saying that you cannot do that using enterprise architecture, or in particular using TOGAF ADM, which is one of the EA frameworks. When you are making your preliminary phase or your vision phase, you are trying to understand your company and which one are your stakeholder concerns. The difference here is like you don't only have to consider not only your business stakeholders, but also your solution stakeholders, which is, at the end of the day, the agile teams. You need to, to work with them and make a, a, a single team in order to really support this agile view. On the other hand, uh, deliver value incrementally is something that you can do. And I think it's a very good chapter about that in the talk of standard, but for some reason it's not so well, perhaps we need to explain it better or provide more guidance, which is how to use the ADM in different architectural styles when using iterations. You can use iterations in parallel 
or in cascade, you can relay them. And then if you pair that with the backlog that we have in Agile, then you have a way to deliver value incrementally following an EA approach. So that's another way to, to address this Agile manifesto. Again, being Agile means having this new team structure. If you have a hierarchy structure in your organization in which uh, teams have no power, either if you're using EA or TOGA or not, it would be very difficult for a team to be Agile. Because if you have to be depending on, on, on decisions taken on the top, then it would be impossible and you wouldn't be able to deliver value in two or three weeks, which is usually, or less than that, the usually um, uh, sprint uh, timing. So you need to have this structure in which you have one team leader what is empowered and is handling the team. That team should be allowing to have business people, technical people, and the enterprise architects in there in order to really be effective. And again, these different teams can be working, depending on the resources that you have, of course, in different iterations at the same time, or in iterations that depend to each other and be perfectly mappy, mapped with sprints that we have in Agile, which is also, again, we have it again, the same view. I mean, you map your different iteration that you want that you do in the ADM cycle with these Agile sprints. Again, it is very important to architect just the minimum some people say, okay, it's better to start with a top-down, uh, with a bottom-up approach, then that might be good. I mean, you take what you have in your design and you uh, make a top assessment on that and you connect your strategy. That's an, a, a way to see it. But at the end of the day, it's just having, just architecting what is really enough and needed depending on your scope. And here again, and I believe this is true, even if you're not using uh, an agile approach with an EA focus, um, if you design your sprint with a scope which is too big, it would be very difficult to really deliver value quickly considering all the different interconnected pieces. So again, scope is something that is key. Like we know it's key when you make an enterprise architecture iteration. So again, in here. And also, you, you, you need to shift your mental model about what it means to govern uh, an iteration or a cycle in this case. In this case, the architect should become a consultant into the Agile team. If there are certain metrics to address or compliance, because sometimes compliance is not only compliance about the architecture itself. It could be external compliance, external standards. So you need to be to become, in this case, uh, a consultant into your Agile team, saying, OK, we need to be addressing this, because otherwise it would be impossible to interconnect with this partner. So that's a compliance issue that you need to be addressed by the governance. It's not like the, aud the audit was going to be there auditing you and stopping your progress. It's a different view. Same with change management. Uh, we don't have to make the change management at the end. Change management is something that should be around all the time. So if you have, for example, again, the ADM, requirement management in the center of that, and you have hours coming all, of, you know, all over in, that means like in every moment it could be a change. So you need to be quickly enough to address that change and to measure the impact. So that's a different view. It's not like, it's not that because it's at the end of the ADM cycle, we need to make it at the end. It's just a shift in the paradigm. And again, like I said, you can perfectly match uh, your uh, capability architectures, the ones that you they are familiar with the talk of standard may have seen this several times. We have the, the, the strategic architecture, which is the ones that is providing the direction, the strategic direction. You have the segments, which are the different segment the different part of your company or your business or your approach that you're handling and you go for the capability architecture which are the ones that are usually more details and they're the ones that will be paired or will be into your roadmap so you can match this with the different backlogs that we have in a sprint development and deliver value quickly and what's the value of this usually in your backlog you start uh, delivering value incrementally and you are keeping in the backlog the thing that you cannot address at this moment. So if you have this segment and the strategic view, it will be easier for you to define priorities in that backlog. Okay, this uh, package for finding a word could be in this sprint. This one is, is strategic, it's important, and it's interconnected with the other. So I need to also start delivering that at the same time. So that's something that if you don't have a whole view, it would be very difficult to be addressed. And again, like I said, we need to Define, find different ways to architect this easily, using a reference architecture, using microservices, 
uh, using uh, different uh, loosely coupled styles of pattern for architecture will help you deliver this, uh, this uh, architecture description more easily, more quickly, and not avoid having, again, this big plan, this big blueprint, and trying to, to divide them in smaller pieces. That's, that's another thing that it's also key if you wanted to take an EA approach towards supporting your agile effort. This is also taken from another open group publication, which is a digital transformation from a strategy to implementation using group, open group standards. In here, again, you don't only have the enterprise architecture view, which is in the top of layers. You have their architecture to support a strategy, to support uh, projects, portfolios, and solutions. In there, you will have the sprints and the solution part. And you also have the IT for IT reference architecture in there, as you may see. Strategy to portfolio, the uh, requirement to deploy, request to fulfill, and detect to correct. In there, you also can have your sprints. And very important, the one that is detect to correct, which is how you change management should be engaged in all this. And of course, you apply all these different styles of architecture and open standards, like the SOA reference architecture, microservices, Internet of Things, uh, data standards, the ones that we usually handle in the open platform uh, forum, and you use them to support also this agility. So it's not only that you can use enterprise architecture to GAF in this, but also open standards in general are supporting this agile view. What about digital transformation? I mean, I think in here, uh, I think the conversation that we have earlier uh, is illustrating this. It's not about um, technology, it's about your business. You need to have a strategic, a digital strategy, not only uh, go all the way and have the digital architecture or architect for digital, and you need to have your strategy that should be connected with your general strategy. You need to be aware again, which of these trends are really affecting my business and how they are being affected. So you have your digital strategy, you make your digital transformation, and here I have taken also the DP book, which is one of our snapshot, which is the digital is the radical fundamental change for an organization to become digital. So radical change means that it's not only go and change your technology, it's change your people, the way you see your customer, the way you interact with your customer, and the way you interconnect your different pieces together. That's the way that you make what you do it digital. And of course, you need to measure how effective you are. If you're not measuring that, it would be very difficult. And you have enterprise architecture in there because you are connecting your strategy. You are connecting all the different elements that you have into your landscape in order to provide that. And you have something like this. You need to have a reference, a digital reference architecture for this. This is just a very a simplification, a very simple example. You have enterprise architecture providing the whole view. You have information which is pervasive. It's uh, providing interconnection between the different layers. You have your business. You have your to, to become digital also in your product, your services, and the way they are connected together, your application, your technology. And of course, how you deliver security. Security is also another key component in here. The more complex a system is, the more difficult is to have it protected. So security is, of course, another key area in here. You have your integration, which is, like we discussed at the beginning, it's not trivial anymore. It's something that should really, we should really be paying attention because we have more complexity now to address. And you have the different solutions and how they are wired together. Again, if we try to go into an EA approach, in this case, again, using the ADM, the first thing that you need to, to have is your digital strategy. Uh, identify how my company, how well my company could be ready to embrace digital. So you make a capability assessment, a maturity assessment of what I have in terms of people, processes, um, products, services. You need to design your new products and services to address that. And you need to have this blueprint. You need to use your reference architecture to architect uh, your digital, again, and provide this digital landscape. And you need to provide a roadmap for incrementally be delivering all that solutions into the market in order to become digital. And here again, I have taken some content for the DP book, which is the seven levels that we have for digital transformation, which that you may see in here is not only about technologies, the processes, is the people, is the, is the culture, is the strategy, is the business ecosystem, and is your products and services. So it's a whole 
transformation is not only going and changing your platforms. Okay, we have spoken a little bit about the practice, even though I have also made several references to the TOGAP standard. Now you may be asking for those of you that are not quite familiar with that yet, what's new in the new version of the standard and how at the open group into the architecture forum, which are the ones that handle and maintain the TOGAP standard, what are we doing in relation to all this? First of all, we released, like you, some of you may be aware, the new version, TOGAP 9.2 in April in London. And we also uh, have, are promoting now, even though it has been there for a while, the TOGAF library, which is this whole set of documents that are supporting the TOGAF standard and they are very rich. So the standard is just more than just a book. It's just all these guidance, white paper, case studies, reference templates that are around it. And they are supporting the way we use it to deliver EA. It's a little bit like um, some numbers about how we are worldwide. This is. Uh, I think it's dated by April. Uh, we may have more higher numbers than these ones at the moment. This is how we're doing in terms of usage of the standard and who's using it and how many accredited courses do we have and people that is actually using the standard. We also, um, you may have seen some of this. Um, it was delivered, this survey was delivered at the beginning of, about uh, mid-October um, by the Association of Enterprise Architects we uh, release a new survey into the market uh, asking the market practitioners, what do you consider is necessary in the, in the new version of the standard to address the new challenges and the new trends? We receive a very good response that you may see in there, even though it was a 20 survey, a 20 question survey was a little bit large. So we received almost 1000 responses. Um, even though most of them were consultants and IT consulting people, we also have very good responses from banking, for government, from retail, for telcos, as you may see in there. And in terms of how this uh, was distributed globally, uh, even though we have mostly of the responses from the US and the UK, we also have respondents from India, from Australia, um, from Canada, from South Africa. So we can say that we have a little bit of differing opinions worldwide, which is something significant because our idea is to release standards that are worldwide, not only for a particular region or country. One of the, 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 the survey is, 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 is long. Actually, we're going to present a few more results for those of you that will be in the TOGAP user group on Wednesday. And we're going to present a little bit more in there. And after this event, we're going to release a whole um, report because like I said, there are a lot of information in that in that survey, uh, because some of the questions were open, that we are going to use precisely to refine our strategy to all the standard. One of the questions was, is the standard ready to support business transformation and innovation? More than 60% of the responses putting together two of the trends that you will see in there. And the standard is well, it's, it's okay, but it needs guidance. So more than 60% of the respondents say, the standard can be used to do that, but we need more guidance. And that's precisely aligned with our strategy to provide more guidance in the use of the standard. The other question that is related with the topics that we have explained today, digital transformation, how well the standard is supporting that? Again, like you can see in there, the two largest uh, bars in there are about, okay, it is fine, but we need guidance. So again, we are paying attention to what the market is saying. And the last one, Agile, which is the other topic where we address again, can be used, but you need more guidance. And in here also, since I said it was an open text question, um, the guidance that the market is asking for is, how can you deliver this minimal viable architecture using the total standard? How can you really use it uh, to support sprints? So that those are the questions. And our challenge has, uh, in my case, as the forum director of the architecture forum and our members is to precisely find a way to address and deliver a response to that question. Okay, what's our vision considering this? Like I just explaining, our strategy was to deliver the standard in the top of 9.2 in London. Uh, what we did, and we started that path, uh, even though the decision had been taken before that at the Architecture Forum, we released the product following this strategy in April, is to start decoupling the standard. We have now the core fundamental part of the standard in, in, in the TOGAM 9.2. And we have started decoupling content. For example, now the business scenario that it used to be uh, one of the chapters in TOGAM 9.1, now is a, a TOGAM series guide. 
I'm going to explain what a TOGAF series guide is now. And the SOA used along with TOGAF is also another separate guide. Security was also taken out and made a separate guide. So the idea is to take the standard and start making some strategic restructure of the standard, taking out what is guidance, for example, tools and techniques, or how to use and adapt the ADM, which is clearly guidance, and keep the core fundamental in the standard. But at the end of the day, since these guides are formal documents, there will also be support in the standard. It's not like we are making it smaller. It's we are making it structurally different to be more consumable and easier to use, because this is another of the usual responses in the survey. The standard is heavy, so you need to make it lighter and easier to use. We received a similar response in the survey we did four years ago. So this is a continuing demand from the market. I mean, give us a standard that is easier to be used. So we are following that approach. And like I said, we have built now this whole body of knowledge that also was mentioned by Steve yesterday in the, in the summaries and the highlights. We have the TOGAF series guide. A TOGAF series guide is some guidance that has a formal status into the open group classification, meaning that, and we are working on that with the certification team, that in a certain moment, it will be also subject to certification. Meaning that you will study, for example, the whole set of business architecture guides that we have. You will receive a digital credential and you will be certified on that. So that's the way that we are going to structure this. So it's not like we are taking out content from the standard and making it white papers. No, there will still be formal part of the standard, but will be structured in a different way. Some summary of the new uh, futures, the ones of you that will be in the training uh, also tomorrow. Uh, we will go deeper into this because what is, is what is uh, examined in the TOGAF Essential uh, in the TOGAF Essential course and exam. Uh, we now uh, have taken out uh, business scenarios, like I just mentioned. We have a set of new guides in business architecture area. They have the status of TOGAF series guide. Those are the business capability, value stream, uh, the reference models, the TRM and the triple IRM also were taken as guides. Uh, we also have other guides that have been published like uh, the TOGAF leader guide, Leaders Guide to establish and, and evolve an, an EA capability. The practitioner's approach to develop uh, architecture using the ADM is another uh, guidance that is a TOGAF series guide. And the ones that we also uh, decouple, which are the, the SOA guide, which is now a TOGAF series guide, and the guide to use security along with TOGAF is also now a TOGAF series guide. There are others on the way. We have several very active groups and, and work streams in the architecture forum that are also delivering that guidance. We also made several improvements in the meta model, especially for business architecture, um, general entities, some changes in general entities. We added certain addition to the business architecture, like for example, business capability, a course of action, value stream. Those are new concepts that were not there in the previous version. And we made also certain changes in relationships, especially for the application and information entities uh, to make it more consistent. And again, a new TOGAF series guide. We also made certain improvements to the definitions. We updated the reference to the 4210-2011 standard, which were out of date in the previous version. And we also made some minor improvements in the ADM phases to provide more clarity, more consistency. And like I just mentioned, we also decoupled the security chapter. It's not anymore the chapter that we have received comments that is it could be improved, so now it's a separate guide, more complete. And again, since it's a separate document, it can evolve easily. That's another important point on the strategy. Since it's the couple, it's easier to be changed and can change faster. So again, following an agile approach for the evolution of the standard. We also made some changes in the repository in order to make it more consistent. The TOGAP library is an important concept, like I just mentioned, all those documents are in there and we are also making a very, a very good job with the marketing team, promoting this uh, more, giving the, this more visibility. We have um, very interesting webinars provided by our uh, partners and our sponsors and our members that some, are somehow hidden in there. So now we are going to give them more visibility, white papers, et cetera. The body of knowledge, like I just mentioned, we are working in that strategy along with the certification team. Uh, so the, now the scope of the TOGAF uh, body of knowledge is not only the standard, but also the, the guys that we have defined that will be formally taking part of the standard. 
the ones that you that will take or haven't have taken already the talk of essential it's a way uh, to close this bridge between uh, the one the people that is talk of nice certified and being certified in the new version so it's that's the way to do it to get the talk of essential there's again a training tomorrow for those of you that are interested and in, that can be taken and it's a it's a very short exam just to test if you know what is new in the standard that's in essence what the credential is the view of the, of the evolution like i just mentioned is to improve the core content give it more consistency update it uh, give it more relevance address uh, certain inconsistencies that are there we are working on this with our membership at the moment uh, define a new serious guide called part of the evolution uh, not only taking some of the core content component and making it um, guides, which is still in discussion into the architecture forum, uh, but also to provide the room for new guides. For example, how to have an agile EA could be one of the guides. That it's, there's already a working team into the forum working on that. Uh, how to connect better um, reference models. There are uh, groups working right now, for example, with Bayan and Archimate and Toga. We have a new TOGA for new AEF mapping activity at the forum. And NAF and NATO is also a new activity that is just starting. And we have more TOGA from COVID. So how to use the standard with other frameworks, how to have new and more uh, reference models to address different verticals, how to address these new trends in technology, how to improve information architecture, how to have more strategic alignment. And there are also a couple of, of uh, documents about strategy that have been published, like separate documents that we may include into a TOGA ecosystem. So all of this is what is happening right now. And that's the vision of the Architecture Forum to decouple the standard and have room for more guidance, again, in response to what the market is asking for us. OK, since we have only a few minutes and perhaps a few questions, I think the wrap up is pretty obvious in here. I think we still need to have, in, even though we have new trends, new business model, new technologies. We still need to have this holistic view, this systemic view of your organization. You need to be able to uh, deliver impact assessment and address risk. For that, you need to have, you need to know your landscape, which is what we do when we deliver enterprise architecture. EA is not a one size fits all. I mean, you need to adapt it. If you consider, and actually there was, there was another response from the survey, I'm using TOGAF along with, with SACMEN or FEAF. I'm using it. I'm using it, but I'm also using SAFE for uh, Agile, which is good. So it's not like you need to take the standard and construct all the deliverables. You need to adapt it depending on your particular situation. We also, I hope, they have delivered this message that the TOGAF standard is evolving, that one of our main objectives into the open group and the architecture forum in particular, it's to evolve the standard in order to respond to what the market is asking for. So for that, your input is really, really important. So. Uh, I wanted to invite you to join us tomorrow in the Toga user group in which we're going to discuss with you what are your pain points while using the standard to deliver the practice. And uh, also, again, like I said, the open group is paying attention to what the market is, is saying, not only through surveys and events like this and Toga user group, but also we have our blogs. Uh, you can reach us anytime for any questions. Uh, also, if you have a case study, if you have something to share with us, you don't have to be a member. You can send us and you can reach us, send us your case study, your view, and we can find a way to make it go into the market. So that's, that's uh, like a final thought uh, from, from the open group and then they have, on behalf of the architect to forum members as well. And thank you very much. And I guess we may have room for a few Q&A. Yes, we do. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> we'll let you sit down now. After yep. that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Quite a few questions, so um, we'll get going. Uh, some of them on Agile, some of them on Architecture Forum things, so a bit of a mix. Okay. But uh, nice job, thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> the outside in trends, trend drives the need to integrate from process driven to data flow driven. What plans does the Architecture Forum have to address the change? Actually, one of the areas that has been a little bit on hold in the last quarter is information architecture. So we are aware of that. So we have been trying to ask our members because we depend also on members' contribution. But now we have uh, one company, I cannot disclose the name at the moment, that is about to become a member of the Open Group. And they have this complete 
and very good uh, information architecture reference models they're going to share with us, and it will be part of the work into the architecture forum to address that. And also, I guess, like into the digital practitioner working group, which is something, it's a working group that we have, um, all members of the open group uh, can have access to that. That's also another area in which we may address that. Right. And it's a key, it's a key point. It's the, the work gets done by the members. We, we facilitate the work gets done by the members, and the members work on the things they want to work on and where there's interest in, in working. So um, uh, if you're interested in these areas, then please get involved. Uh, how different is API Gateway, is the API Gateway in the new EA paradigm compared to SOA? I guess like, uh, like I just said, uh, SOA has the particular view to, to have the, the different services, how you connect them, how you create your contract and connect them. I guess Gateway is just another pattern. Again, you need to go and make an assessment of the technology behind it and see mm -hmm. if it's really applicable or not. So at the end of the day, it depends on what you wanted to do with them without going into the technical detail is, I mean, it, it may be that in certain areas I need SOA, in other areas I need microservices, in mm -hmm. other I need APs or gateways, so it depends on what you're going to do. Okay. Uh, for new agile applications, do we need to detail not only the app, how the app works and is interconnected, but how the DevOps process works? I guess the two of them go together. On one hand, you have your building blocks, that even if you're doing agile, you have building blocks. It could be, for example, that if your application is made of things that are in the cloud, for example, you, you don't need to understand the detail. Mm -hmm. At the end, it's, it becomes like a black box. And you use DevOps and any other methodology for agile for a way to deliver it. So the user has an input, and you use your approach to deliver value easily. And at the end, what you need to understand is that for example, if you have this, this building block which is made and is functioning, you don't need to architect what is inside. Again, mm -hmm. architect the minimum. Okay. Uh, are there any defined and prescribed guidelines for Agile EA? We are already working on that. We have a couple of uh, initiatives. One of them is into the Architect Forum. The other one is starting uh, perhaps after this conference. And uh, I think in the Architect Forum members are aware that we need to address that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess like uh, um, uh, even though teams are just starting over, one of them is first how the practice itself can be agile before going into the standard itself. Mm -hmm. In a second delivery will be how I can use TOGAF in an agile way. And not only TOGAF or enterprise architecture, I guess it should go into all the standards because it's something like holistic. It's not only enterprise architecture. So I guess that's the way, I mean, to start with the practice and then go into the different standards. So that's, in general, the approach. Right, so in process, basically. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. How does TOGAF recommend mapping the customer journey vision and customer experience vision? I would say that you need to consider the customer since the very beginning. I mean, if you're delivering your vision, for example, your strategy, Okay, if you need to deliver, for example, to improve the way you connect your, your customer, but you need to understand the needs of your customer, which is your stakeholder, you that at the, on phase A, you need to address which capabilities do I have for delivering this customer journey, you do that in the preliminary phase. Then you start architecting uh, your product and services and your customer journey. You design your customer journey in the business, uh, in the business architecture phase. You start identifying the information flow that you need all over that. You do that in information and in data architecture. Then you identify the different APIs, the different applications, either internal or external that need to be connected to that. And you connect the platform and technology. You address how are you going to solve all of that when you do the, uh, in the solution and road mapping and, and migration plan. And finally, you need to govern and measure the value of this value chain. So you can start with a prototype and you can go deeper. Okay. Uh, with increased sprints, talk, you had a chart with, uh, with sprints and uh, you know, agile approach. With increased sprints, how do you manage governance and compliance? I think governance and compliance should be immersed into the process. Again, it's not like I started working, I have the job to deliver value in three weeks, and then the last day, the architect will come, you need to change everything again. It's not the way that it should work. Architects should be there at the very beginning, and compliance should be one of the requirements. Mm. But again, if you don't have the whole view, it's impossible for you to know in advance what you need to govern in the sprint. Right. Right. 
In practice, Agile seems to be adopted only during design and build. How much do you think Agile EA adoption is in place now? I would say that it's just beginning. I mean, there's different conversation, there are different point of view. There's people that say EA cannot be Agile. So they say they, it can be Agile, but there's a trade-off. And I guess one of the things that we need to change from the very beginning is the set of our minds. I mean, it's like in the old days when you have the business people and technical people struggling. Now that doesn't exist anymore. It, it took years. I guess it's the same. I guess like you can use Agile only for, if you, for example, wanted to architect something that is very specific, and again, it's not that complex, you may not need EA because you just need to be one development, just put this uh, two or three week development into your team and do it. You don't need to have the architect in there. But if you want to, for example, to change your customer journey using an agile, you need EA in there. Yeah. Right. Um, given data is all over the place, the, per the pervasive architecture seems to gain more value and focus once we start associating um, for Actually, there's something I can't read there. Once we start associating maybe the linkages for each, how does your framework stay relevant? So it's the pervasive architecture seems to gain more value and focus once we start associating it with each. I don't know. I'm not sure I can answer that. Is there someone who asked that question who can clarify it? <laughs> Unless you understand it. I guess like we need to have is a very good design on your data framework and have a very good metadata to describe your data. Again, how the data should be stored and managed and interchanged, especially in the case that you say that it's everywhere. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to have this framework starting with the business and then defining, okay, how, which one is the owner of the data? Which one should be the structure of the data? How is going to be shared? How is to be, to be interconnected? How can interoperate with that? And again, if you have that very well-defined, of course, you need to make an adjustment all the time because things are changing. But it doesn't matter if uh, information is, is distributed because at the end of the day, that's the instances of the data. You need to have good metadata and a very good framework to describe all that. I don't know if I addressed your question because it was a little bit large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 All right, thank you. So uh, one more before we wrap up. Um, what do you think is required by an enterprise to switch to Agile EA? I guess you need to start, like I said at the beginning, defining your e capabilities. I mean, first you need to talk with your architects and make them understand that this is making EA just in a different way, in a way that is more dynamic and avoid having this ivory tower in which they mm -hmm. are and then they are like invisible and touchable. That, that's one of the first thing. I mean, you need to start changing the mind of the people and the resistance to change. Right. And that goes also for the delivery teams. They like all oh, the architects, the one that is coming to see and make some auditing here and make me stop my work, it's not the way. So the, this is the one of the first steps. Try to create these capabilities in terms of people, the tooling that I have, the processes, and, and make people work together. And also, very important, how my organization has a structure. If I have an organization that is very hierarchy, like I explained in one of the slides, it would be very difficult to have an agile approach. Mm -hmm. You need to be mm -hmm. agile in the way you take decision and the way you work and the way you empower your people mm -hmm. to be agile. It's like you said, it's not one size fits all. You're not no. necessarily going to need no. an agile approach for everything. Or exactly, but, but again, you need to, 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 to see what you have and how you yeah. can take in the different pieces, how can this become agile. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sonia, we'll leave it there and let people have a break, but thank you very much for that. Okay, very thank enlightening. You. Thank okay. you.